Welcome, and allow me to share with you the story of one of the most infamous Romans of all, a tale of excess and cruelty. A moral story, chock-a-block full of lessons for the Roman elite. At the centre of it, a despicable character, whose gratuitous displays of wealth and sadism left a sour taste in the mouth of his peers, disdain in the eyes of his superiors, and fear in the hearts of his slaves. There was once a man called Vedius Pollio, who was born in the first century BCE to chaotic and unstable circumstances. His father had been a slave, but luckily for the young Vedius, his dad had been legally freed before his birth. Thus, he had avoided being born into slavery. But he was still living in an era of civil wars and violence as the Roman Republic fell, and as a man of no great rank. We have no idea how the young Vedius dealt with these turbulent times, but he must have been quite the opportunist because he managed to work his way up to the rank of Roman equestrian despite his humble origins and acquire for himself quite a bit of wealth. Pollio's new rank opened the doorway to further riches and power, and he attached himself to a promising young politician called Octavian. Now this turned out to be a rather wise investment because after a few more rounds of civil wars, Octavian became the sole ruler of the Roman world. The Roman Imperial Age was born, and Octavian, who changed his name to Augustus, was its first emperor. And by his side was Vedius Pollio, ever ambitious and ready to continue climbing the social ladder. And the emperor must have trusted him because he was awarded the governorship of the province of Asia, which is in modern western Turkey. And during his governorship, he made himself even richer, rich enough to return to Italy and start living the decadent life of a Roman noble. He started this new life by thanking his patron by setting up a shrine to Augustus in Benevento, and then moved to the Bay of Naples to set up shop there. And to give you an idea of the significance of this, if the Romans had monopoly, the Bay of Naples would be one of the really dark blue squares at the end. You know, the expensive ones where if you land on them in the late game, you're essentially ruined. It was where all the wealthiest Romans went to set up estates. And, as if moving to one of the bougiest regions of the Roman Empire wasn't enough, Vedius Pollio built himself an immense villa, opulent as anything. The poet Ovid said that it was more like a city than one man's villa. A enormous shrine to Pollio's wealth and vice. And this villa was pretty Bond villain-esque. I mean, we can imagine it was luxurious as anything, with private gardens and sun lounges and things, but the sources only mention one pretty dark installation, a pond which Pollio had filled with lampreys, these predatory eel-like things which he'd trained to eat human flesh. The idea being that if any of his slaves displeased him, he would throw them into the pond to be eaten alive. For those of you lucky enough to have never laid eyes on a lamprey, this is what one of their mouths look like. And as you can see, these jawless wonders constitute one of nature's greatest crimes against all that is good. In the wild, they use these suction cup type mouths to latch on to larger prey, bur burrow under their skin, and then eat them from the inside out, which is deeply unpleasant. And this was the fate that awaited any slave that got on this particular master's bad side. So if you're wondering if Pollio's background as the son of an ex-slave led him to be a more sympathetic and gentle master, nope. So this is the story of Vedius Pollio so far. Son of a freedman, turned favourite of the emperor, turned Roman governor, turned wealthy nobleman living in the Bay of Naples, ruling sadistically over his slaves. And he could have maintained this Bond villain-esque life forever, if it weren't for one fateful visit from the Emperor one day. Remember that the Emperor Augustus was this guy's patron. He had trusted him with positions and power, and in return he had rewarded him accordingly. So when he invites himself over, the host has to bring out the big guns. All the domestic slaves made the place spotless for the Emperor's visit. The food, the best the region had to offer. The wine, from Setia. Expensive stuff, but the Emperor's favourite. And the glasses they were going to drink from, Crystal. Pollio's own collection of finest crystal glass goblets. He was certain that when Augustus took a sip of his favourite wine out of this, he was sure to be impressed. And so the Emperor arrives, and the two men recline to start eating. But when the slaves bring out the crystal goblets to be filled with wine, 
one of them trips and drops the glass and smashes it. Polio, absolutely furious, forgets that he's currently entertaining the leader of the known world and goes into an absolute rage. He insists that the slave be taken there and then and thrown into the pond of lampreys to be eaten alive. The slave is rightfully terrified by this prospect and he throws himself at the feet of the emperor, begging for mercy. He says that he understands he might have to be executed and he's willing to die for his mistake, but please can it be through some other method than being eaten alive by eels? So Augustus says, look, if your crystal glass selection is really so precious and so valuable that it's worth killing a slave so cruelly over, it must be worth seeing, I'd like to see the rest of it. And so the glasses are brought out and the emperor takes them one by one and smashes them in front of Polio's own eyes. He then forces the master to sell the slave to him, the same one he was going to execute, and he frees that slave. And then finally on his way out, he has the lamprey pond filled in and the killer eels all die. <music> Vedius Pollio dies a few years later, of natural causes probably, and Augustus gets his villa, his opulent, huge one that Ovid described as being like a city, and he flattens it. And the only thing that remains afterwards is a single colonnade dedicated not to Vedius Pollio, but to the emperor's wife, Livia. Thus ends the life of Vedius Pollio. His riches gone, his villa demolished, and his reputation only surviving in the form of this story. This very, very popular story. This story so popular that it's referenced by several authors throughout Roman history. In fact, the version that I just gave you is considerably longer than any that survives from ancient Rome itself, because I combined the stories of Seneca, the philosopher, Pliny, the natural historian, Cassius Dio, the regular historian, and Ovid, who was a poet slash sex pest. It was clearly a very popular tale told amongst the Roman elite to each other, which is unusual because it's probably not entirely true. To start with, I can't find any recorded case of lampreys killing and eating a human being. In fact, the only person they seem to have killed was Henry I of England, who supposedly fell ill after eating a lamprey dish and died not long afterwards. So if I were you, I'd worry less about these nightmare eels and more about the other horrific things that dwell beneath the waves. But also, stories like this don't need to be true, or not entirely true anyway. That's not why people tell them. People tell stories because they're fun, and more importantly, they're a great vessel for teaching or discussing ideas, morals, and values. Just think about how often stories are used to illustrate lessons, from the parables of the Bible to childhood fables like the tortoise and the hare, which coincidentally has its roots in Roman slave stories. Or how often philosophers, both ancient and modern, use stories or fictitious setups to make a point or to facilitate a discussion. I mean, is Plato's Symposium an accurate record of what actually went down at an ancient Athenian drinking party? Or is that not the point? And this is what makes the story of Vedius Pollio so interesting. Not that it might have happened, but that Romans considered it worth telling for centuries because it had lessons in it that were worth learning. And what those lessons were illustrate some of the key differences between ancient Rome and our modern society today. Take, for example, the version of the story that we get from the philosopher Seneca's letters entitled On Clemency. These were letters that he wrote to the young emperor Nero a few years before he goes completely mad, and he's trying to show how to be a good ruler. And Seneca's takeaway from the story is, don't be a cruel master because cruel masters are pointed out with disgust in all parts of the city and are hated and loathed. The wrongdoings of kings are enacted on a wider theatre. Their shame and unpopularity endures for ages. Yet how far better it would have been to have never been born than to be numbered among those who have been born to do their country harm. In another letter by Seneca, this one addressed to his brother and on the subject of anger, he references the story of Vedius Pollio again. But this time it's to show off the wisdom of the Emperor Augustus, who punishes the rich and cruel sadistic master by smashing all of his glasses and filling in his lamprey pond. 
This was the proper way for Caesar to reprove his friend. He made good use of his power. Who are you that when you're at dinner you order a man to be put to death? and mangled by an unheard of form of torture. Are a man's bowels to be torn asunder because your cup is broken? You must think a great deal of yourself if even when the emperor is present, you order men to be executed. Now it may seem to us that Seneca's lesson here is be nice to your slaves because that's the nice thing to do and then everyone will think you're nice and that's nice. But that might be a little bit too modern a reading of it. Remember that the Romans never really questioned their right to own slaves or to treat them in a way that we'd consider cruel and violent. What Seneca's actually trying to do is show us how a good master behaves. And although a good master is better than a cruel master, it's still a master, which is inherently oppressive and exploitative. There's another story from a little bit later that kind of complements this. Galen was a second century Greek physician, and kind of a bit of a philosopher as well, who talks about how admirable his father was for chastising his friends for all of the bruises that they had from beating their slaves out of anger. And he tells us numerous stories of slave owners, from friends of his all the way up to the Emperor Hadrian, who lash out in fury at their slaves, who assault them on the spot or use styluses to stab them in the eye. And although he doesn't necessarily disapprove of violence towards slaves on principle, he reckons that these masters should have instead waited a while and used a rod or whip to inflict as many blows as they wished and to accomplish the act with reflection. Galen took issue with masters who acted in anger, irrationally, without thinking, and therefore don't punish their slaves properly. The advice that he gives. So too, you must exhort yourself never to strike a slave with your own hands, nor to assign the task to another while you are angry. Put it off until the next day, after your wrath has subsided. You will consider with greater prudence how many lashes should be given to the one who has merited the flogging. In this light, the lesson of the story of Vedius Pollio might have less to do with not being cruel to your slaves, and more to do with being cruel properly, after due thought and consideration and philosophical pondering, and not irrationally and out of anger and emotion. But that's that version of the story. There are other versions given to us by Cassius Dio, who wrote in the late 2nd, early 3rd century CE, so about 200 years after the life of Vedius Pollio, and Ovid, who was a more contemporary poet. Both Dio and Ovid focus a little bit more on the opulence of Pollio's living and lifestyle, something that they both find very, very distasteful. Ovid doesn't even mention the killer lampreys. He focuses entirely on the gaudy, horrific, but like a city villa that Pollio built for himself in the Bay of Naples. Dio also feels the need to praise the Emperor Augustus for demolishing the villa after Pollio's death. The Romans didn't really like these excessive displays of wealth. Well, they did, but they liked it differently. Pollio's was tacky, gaudy, a little bit too nouveau riche. And perhaps quite a lot of this had to do with the fact that Vedius Pollio was the son of a freedman, not a senator. The Romans were always very, very, very suspicious of self-made men or people who didn't inherit their wealth. And you can imagine a few of them felt a great deal of satisfaction when Augustus, who was not only the emperor, but the paterfamilias of one of the oldest and most aristocratic families in Rome demolished the gaudy mansion of this new money son of a freedman type and asserts those good old conservative traditional Roman values. After all, hereditary wealth was the only honorable way to become rich, or at least so thought rich people who had inherited all of their wealth. So that's the story of Vedius Pollio a man who would be cited by Romans for centuries as the worst example of a rich slave owner. And when we really look at the kind of people who were telling this story to each other and the way they told it, it reveals to us a great deal of the main differences between ancient Rome and our modern world. Their unquestioning acceptance of the existence of slavery, their distrust of self-made men, and their admiration for the leadership style of emperors like Augustus. And if there is a moral here, I suppose it's that if you're going to indulge in sickening activities under the impression that your power and wealth might protect you, maybe be a little more subtle than Pollio was. 
Like definitely don't do a televised interview trying to worm your way out of it or anything. Or before you know it, your own people might turn against you and your story may only be referenced in regards to how repulsive your behavior is. Thank you for watching.